All right, hello and welcome everyone. Sorry I'm starting a bit late here. Uh, but today I have redeemed Zoomer because um, you know, I'd seen you around Twitter quite a bit, uh, but I didn't really know much about your content at all. And then you reached out to me with some questions about SCOTUS because you've gotten interested in SCOTUSM. So yes. I thought we could just have a discussion here about SCOTUSM and see where things go. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, thanks for having me on your channel. I'm Redeem Zoomer. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a YouTuber, Instagrammer, not a pastor or anything, but I am very interested in theology. And lately I've been getting a lot into Scotist metaphysics because I hadn't really uh, understood or well, I, I'd known about it, but I hadn't really studied scholasticism and metaphysics until pretty recently. And I realized that Scotus taught a lot of things that I had already agreed with, such as defining God as the infinite and also the absolute primacy of Christ, that the incarnation of Christ still would have happened regardless of the fall of man. So going down that rabbit hole has caused me to change a lot of my theological views. I went from an infralapsarian Calvinist to a superlapsarian Calvinist and a few other things. Uh, but yeah, so do you think that there is um, an influence of Scotism on the Reformation? Um, I don't know if on the Reformation itself so much, but it, there does seem to be some influence on later Reformed thought. Um, one of the things that does seem to be an influence is that Scotus does seem to be thinking of things more in terms of a covenant theology, but I also think it's a covenant theology that's quite different from how we use the word nowadays. Because for Scotus, fundamentally everything is based upon the instances of the divine decree. So God from all eternity decrees uh, certain things that are essentially involves the creation of the world, salvation, history, and so on. And so the first thing in the divine intention within that ordering, Scotus thinks, is the incarnation that God, um, he could have done an infinite number of different possible things, but we know from history that what God has actually done is the incarnation. This is his greatest work. So this clearly must be the purpose of all things. And so for Scotus, then the covenant, I think, is fundamentally about this divine intention. First of all, we tend to think of covenants more in terms of the historical outworking now. But for Scotus, it's ultimately rooted in the metaphysics of the divine will, first of all. And I've heard that that does actually have an influence on reformed thought. Um, there's a good book on this subject. I'm trying to remember the name of the author now. Um, Aaron Denlinger. Yes, yeah, book. Um, Omnes in Adam um, something. It's a Latin title, but it's an English book. Where it's a study on Ambrosius Catharinus, who is actually a counter-Reformation Dominican, who was highly influenced by Scotus. And uh, Catharinus's theology of the covenant seems to have been very influential on the Reformed, according to Denlinger. And when I was reading his account of Catharinus, it seemed to me that Catharinus himself had a lot of influence from Scotus there. I think this is nice. something that absolutely needs more uh, study, though. Nice. I do know that, especially this is more developed and more fleshed out in later Reformed thought, there is what we call the covenant of redemption, which is the covenant mm -hmm. God makes with the three persons of the Trinity, God makes with himself, and the covenant of grace and the covenant of works, which are parallel to each other in history. Those are outworkings of that um, divine covenant of redemption. So it's possible someone could study to see if there's a connection between those two things. Yeah. yeah one of the things Denlinger uh, highlights, which I think is in SCOTUS as well, is the idea of a prelapsarian covenant with Adam. And that seems yeah. to play a very significant role later on in reform thought. So SCOTUS does believe in a prelapsarian covenant with Adam, right? Yeah. So yeah, he won't use the language as much of covenant, but that's essentially what's going on. That yeah. there is a um, original justice that Adam is given, and Adam has to preserve that justice. And in failing to uh, follow God, Adam, and Adam, by breaking the terms of the agreement made with him, breaks that. This is treated very well, I think, in the um, lecture as treatment of Adam. Well, that's exactly what the Westminster Confession says. The Westminster speaks that it's called the Covenant of Works. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So uh, when we think of like predestination, especially like infralapsarian predestination versus mm -hmm. superlapsarian predestination, we think of Calvinism. But mm -hmm. I recently discovered that 
Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus believed in the same type of predestination that Calvinism does, even though they were medieval Catholic theologians. So did Scotus really believe in a supralapsarian predestination that implies not just to corporate predestination, but also individual predestination? Yeah, so I think we have to make some distinctions here because it seems to me there's some differences in Reformed thought here on whether um, reprobation is something active. Because for all the medievals, it's reprobation not. is not something active. It's not um, I've seen some, either. Yeah, that's what I've heard is the majority position among the Reformed. Uh, I've seen some passages in Calvin that look the other way, but I'm not a Calvin scholar at all, so I don't want to comment mm -hmm. too much on that. Um, but yes, for Scotus, when he's dealing with predestination, he affirms very clearly that when God wills to create, he gives the examples of Peter and Judas. He wills for Peter glory, and he wills nothing for Judas. So he doesn't will hell for Judas, but he wills nothing either way. Yes. So um, Sc Scotus makes an important distinction. Do you know Latin at all? Uh, not really. I know. Okay. Like, yeah. So uh, vele is to will, and nole. So nole is the negative form of vele. And in sort of traditional Latin grammar, it's just the opposite of vele. But Scotus draws an important distinction between nole, which is to will not, and non vele, which is to not will. And so there's the possibility then in Scotist philosophy of a neutral act, an act which is neither for or against something. So God wills vele for um, Peter. He wills to give him grace. But he doesn't will nole for Judas. He wills non vele. There's no for or against Judas. And so then in the actual outworking of salvation history, then because of the fall, Judas can, is then damned because he's under original sin as well as his own actual sins. And yeah. now Scotus doesn't really develop then what would have happened to Judas had the fall never happened. He seems to think that that's a possibility. And as far as I can tell in his writings, he doesn't deal with that so much. What would have happened? Now, maybe we can't know it all. But at the very least, Scotus thinks we can go from what actually happens in history to then working out in the um, divine intentions how things were predestined according to that. And then we could perhaps occasionally make references to how things might have worked up in um, other cases. Nice. What you're saying, that sounds exactly like every reform scholastic I've read. I know that mm -hmm. you, I know which passages of Calvin you're talking about. Calvin's mm -hmm. not a scholastic. He is often a bit careless as a lot of the reformers are when it comes to the language they use because they're not making all these clear distinctions. But yeah. in every reform scholastic, even the most hardcore, high Calvinist, superlapsarian scholastics like William Perkins or Samuel Rutherford, the Presbyterian scholastic, they very clearly say God's decree of reprobation is passive and that reprobation is this simply the decree not to give grace. Reprobation is not damnation. And that damnation mm -hmm. is only ever based on sin that is freely willed. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, it does seem to me that the initial reformers seem to have a very big issue with SCOTUS. They're always polemical whenever they mention him. Um, and we do know that at Oxford, some of the early Anglicans destroyed many works of SCOTUS. So we're missing, for example, any scriptural commentaries by SCOTUS because those seem to have been destroyed in the early Reformation. Um but perhaps some of the later reformed had a more positive reception of him. Because a big reason that Scotus was hated among a lot of the early reformers is what Scotus was known for was the Immaculate Conception. Right. And this seems to be one area of significant difference between the reformed and Scotus. Because Scotus takes it as an axiom of theology that we ought to give the highest glory possible to Mary. Right. That there are substantial differences between the medieval Catholics and the reformers. I don't think predestination is one of them. I think the mm -hmm. doctrine of predestination in Thomas and Scotus is identical. Here's a, a, a controversy that has just been on my mind lately. It's probably it's how I discovered Scotus about mm -hmm. the absolute primacy of Christ and the necessity of the incarnation. So in Reformed theology, um, there's a, there's like a 20th century debate between Karl Barth and Van Til about whether the incarnation was just to solve the problem of Adam violating the covenant of works or whether the incarnation had some greater purpose. Van Til would say, no, the incarnation would not have happened if Adam had not eaten from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Karl Barth would say the incarnation would be necessary regardless. And when I first learned about that, I sided with Barth. I thought he made much better arguments. And then I realized that that was a medieval debate between Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. So what was the difference between the two of them on that issue? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion around this issue because it's there's really, I think, a number of distinct questions that are all being wrapped up into one, right? So we're asking whether he would have come, whether he had to come, whether he had to come in the first place regardless, whether he only had to come in this specific economy. Um, you know, there's a few other questions that are all really being wrapped up into one. We have to treat these issues separately. Because Aquinas okay. doesn't even say that Christ wouldn't have come. Aquinas' position really is that we can't know whether or not Christ would have come. Because okay. the issue, there's an already ongoing debate in the sort of, begins I think around the 12th century or so. So it's generation before Aquinas and Bonaventure and all of them on this issue where a number of people are saying that the incarnation is necessary. And now this poses a big issue if the incarnation is necessary that limits divine freedom because creation has to be a free act of God. This was treated dogmatically. And so as a result, the incarnation was necessary then it seems to follow that God wouldn't be free. And so this is essentially where Aquinas takes really big issue with the absolute premacy. Um, that's well, it's one of his two big issues. That It's that one. And then he also says that he thinks the um, scripture and the saints teach that uh, Christ came primarily for sin. And so if there wasn't sin, there wouldn't have been the incarnation. Now, Scotus actually agrees with Aquinas on that first point that... Um, the incarnation cannot be considered necessary at all. But well, then, Scotus yeah. thinks we can look at what actually happened in history, which is the incarnation, and then reason to where it is within the divine will. Then from the fact that we know it's first in the intention of the divine will, then we realize it can't be primarily for sin. Really what it's primarily for is what's well, God's intention ultimately. It is the final cause. It's not for the sake of something else, but it's that for which everything else is for the sake of. And so then creation is ultimately for the sake of incarnation. And so of course it would have happened apart from that. And then there's some other positions that get developed uh, by the Thomists in response to Scotus, which were even more detailed. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people think Scotus's position is a necessary incarnation. When I think that that's really not at all Scotus's position. Scotus's position is that the incarnation is the final cause of God's willing ad extra. Right. So yeah, I recently realized that there are two questions that we've been conflating into one. The first question is, is there any greater purpose to the incarnation of Christ becoming mm -hmm. man other than to deal with sin? The other question is, is the world created for Christ's incarnation? Now, I would agree mm -hmm. with Scotus on both of these questions, or at least I think I do. Um, I was reading Athanasius the other day because I want to know what his opinion on is. He is mm -hmm. probably the greatest theologian. So he does seem to say that the incarnation has some greater purpose than dealing with sin because he says that, you know, God needed to become man so we could become God. He says that um, God needed to become a son of man so the creation could become a son of God. So he seems to say that the incarnation has some sort of purpose for the creation. But mm -hmm. he seems to also say that the incarnation was for the creation, was the incarnation was for us rather yeah. than us existing for the incarnation. So do you think that Athanasius and Scotus disagree on that point? I think there's a tension going on here that the patristics, when they're writing on this, are not thinking of it just in the same way you mentioned with Calvin's not thinking of this in the same way as like later scholastics. I think it's the same thing with the patristic sources. They mentioned there's later Thomas positions on this, and one of the most developed ones comes from the Salamanca Carmelites, we, uh, also often called the Salamantichenses, where they try to affirm both that Christ is primarily redeemer, that's the primary intention, and that he's first in the intention of the divine will. So you sort of end up with this position that God allows Adam to fall specifically so that Christ can become redeemer, because essentially then without the fall of Adam, the fulfillment of creation would have been impossible in their position. And so I think I can see how they could read certain fathers that way, but I think that you end up in very problematic philosophical places if that's your position. And I think it ends up confusing the pre and post lapsarian orders of things too much. And so I think the Scotist position is still able to affirm everything the fathers say without ending up in what I think are ultimately absurd philosophical positions. You just have to read certain statements of the fathers in terms of the actual outworking of salvation history. Because for Scotus, Christ coming to save us from sin is part of the divine decree. Because the divine decree also takes into account what humans freely choose to do. But we also have to consider the internal ordering of the divine decree. And so for Scotus, the 
incarnation just generally considered is prior to any consideration of humans. But the way the mode in which Christ comes is after consideration of it. And there's a number of different Scotus theories in the 17th century that are developed in trying to respond to various Thomists on this point of how exactly this is. Yeah. So for Scotus, if the incarnation, uh, if, if the fall hadn't happened, he thinks Christ would have come immediately in glory. So Christ from the moment of his conception would have been like he'll be at the second coming or after the resurrection. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, here's sort of how I ended up falling into Scotism and superlapsarianism. Here's sort of the development of, of my thinking. So it was a couple years ago I first got into like um, the more traditional Reformed theology, expanding beyond just TULIP and getting into sacramental theology. And I was an infralapsarian back then because I thought superlapsarianism meant God actively creates people for hell. I didn't want to believe that. Um mm -hmm. I was looking at the distinct the differences on the Eucharist between the Reformed and the Lutheran, and the fundamental Christological difference between behind the difference is the Reformed idea that the finite is not capable of the infinite, and that's why the body of Christ is not ubiquitous. The body of Christ cannot be present in a million places at once if it's a true human nature. So mm -hmm. I began to think about like the mathematical implications of this statement, the finite is not capable of the infinite. I, even I asked some of my uh, advanced math professors, like my topology professor, is that axiom true that the finite is not capable of the infinite? She said, yes. So I was like, May, uh, the Lutheran accusation against the Reformed when he say the finite is not capable of the infinite is that we're denying the incarnation. And I had to formulate some response to that. So what I thought of in response is, no, the we're not denying the incarnation. We're explaining why it's necessary. The fact that the finite is not capable of the infinite explains why the incarnation is necessary to unite the finite and the infinite. And then after I read some Karl Barth, I realized that that's exactly what he said. That he said mm -hmm. the incarnate one of the purposes of the incarnation is simply to reconcile the infinite difference between us and God because God is infinite and we're finite. Um, and then that's what led me into Scotism. So would Scotus have any of those same ideas? Somewhat, yeah. So um I guess I think he might be reasoning to this a bit differently because I think Scotus would be afraid of saying the incarnation is necessary to to uh, bridge the infinite and the finite. But I think, in fact, the incarnation is, in fact, the way infinite and finite are bridged. Have you gotten into the disjunctive transcendentals in SCOTUS? Uh, no, not yet, but that sounds like something uh, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, so for SCOTUS, metaphysics is fundamentally the study of being and its properties. And he thinks okay. being can either have simple or disjunctive properties. So simple properties are one true and good. This is true of all being. It's um, necessarily true of being. And then there's also disjunctive properties where if considering all being together, all being would have one of the sides of this. So like necessary, um, contingent, infinite, finite, act, potency, so on and so on and so forth. You could think of any division you can think of in being, simple, complex. You can divide it into one of these two sides. A being is either in one or the other one of these. And it's interesting, when you go through these, he's clearly drawing on Aristotle and a general sort of Platonic Aristotelian metaphysical tradition and trying to formulate this, especially out of how it's received out of the earlier Franciscan tradition. Uh, but what's interesting, when you look at his list of disjunctive transcendentals and look at like the church fathers talking about how Christ bridges like finite, infinite, simple, complex, and so on, you start realizing, oh, all these different disjunctive modes of being come together in a singular hypostasis in the person of Christ. So in that one person, two really distinct natures are able to come together. So I don't think Scotus is drawing some new conclusion to the problem, because the problem is already solved by the Council of Chalcedon. But I think he's drawing out here, in light of maybe an Aristotelian shift in metaphysics, what this exactly means, that all these different modes of being that we can think of uh, in terms of the way being can be divided, because metaphysics is the study of being and its properties. And so this is where then Scotus is going to have a, a univocal concept of being. Not that infinite and finite are really the same kind of thing, but that fundamentally between infinite and finite, there has to be something common. And what is that? It's it, it's being that's common between the two of them. It's um, But Scotus simply defines being as that to which essay or to be is not repugnant. So which existence is not repugnant to the thing. So both infinite and finite, well, something can exist either as infinite or finite, and that's what they share in common with one another.
Um, so do you think that Christ is the only reason that they can share uh, the property of being? Uh, no, no. I think in God's act of creation, there's already a common property of being. I think it's the univocal. I think what Christ does is he instantiates in a single person the univocal concept of being. So he gives us sort of almost a theological instantiation of this philosophical principle that I think we can get to by reason. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, uh, and then with the finite and infinite. I wanted to mention that I actually do think SCOTUS has important implications on mathematics. I was going to ask you about to, that. Great. Yes, I think there has to be a bit of carefulness of how we're using that word infinite. Because there's some really interesting discussion. SCOTUS hints in this direction. I'd like to see if it's there more in his thought or he just hints at it. In the argument for God in the Ordinatio, he's discussing objections to um, divine infinity. And one of the ones he has is, well, couldn't the universe be infinitely old, for example? And he says there that that infinity would not be the same as God's infinity. And I think fundamentally what he's getting at there is God's is not an infinite quantity, but rather he transcends the category of quantity altogether. And Scotus, I'm doing some research actually on this area, so I'm not fully certain on my thoughts here yet, but I've been doing some research for a grad school paper on St. Bonaventure and his epistemology. Because Scotus is drawing a lot on ideas of infinity that were already beginning to be worked out in Bonaventure. And in Bonaventure, in his questions on the knowledge of Christ, he brings up how God has an infinite number of ideas. And he draws this heavily from St. Augustine. Uh, but St. Augustine doesn't seem to so much talk about God as infinite being. Well, in the Eastern Fathers, you seem to have a really strong sense of God as infinite being. But I noticed the only section of that work of Bonaventure that um, none of the Eastern Fathers are cited in is that question of God's infinite knowledge. But in the questions on the mystery of the Trinity, which he wrote around the same time, there he draws a lot on the Eastern Fathers for understanding infinity. Um, he actually specifically lifts a phrase from Maximus of um, the Trinity as a triple infinity. And so we're seeing here that in this Franciscan tradition, we're drawing together sort of Augustinian and um, Greek theories of infinity, I think, are sort of coming together here. And there's a working out of what is infinity. Because for uh, the Thomistic tradition, it seems like infinity is primarily something negative, that there is a lacking of any limit on God. Versus Scotus will refer to infinity as a positive perfection of the divine uh, essence. That there's actually something positive we're saying here. That God sort of goes on and on and on forever. But beyond any even sense of quantity all, whatsoever. What I'm trying to get at here is I think within the divine essence, right? It goes beyond even infinite quantity. But because it goes beyond infinite quantity, it's able to comprehend infinite quantity. And so I think here from Augustine going through Scotus, we start to get an understanding of that there could possibly be an infinite quantity that we can talk about. Because for Aristotle, um, infinity is only ever potential. Uh, there's a potential infinity, but there can never be an actual infinity, right? So if you have like a pile of rocks, you can always come and add one more rock to it. So Aristotle says, well, that could go on to infinity, but you can never actually reach infinity there. Whereas it seems once you have a God who is infinite being, this opens up the possibility of at least within the divine mind, a real actual infinity. And what's interesting is the main modern mathematician who came to formulate uh, sort of modern mathematical theories of infinity is George Cantor. And Cantor actually was inspired by those same passages of Augustine. Um, as Cantor himself, I think, was a devout Lutheran, it seems like. Um, but was very interested in Catholic theology. He corresponded quite a bit with um, Cardinal Franzelin, who was one of the um, sort of top theologians at the time. And he wrote some tracts to Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, trying to explain his view. I don't know if Leo the Thirteenth ever wrote back, um, but he really wanted to ensure the theological orthodoxy of his idea, and he and he also argues that these what he calls transfinite numbers, so mathematical infinities. He says there's an absolute infinity of God which transcends even beyond these transfinite numbers. These transfinite numbers are just other numbers God can work with essentially, and I think that's fundamentally what it gets at is that it opens up the possibility that within God's mind, he can comprehend an infinite quantity or an infinite position or things like that. And so we can then yeah. use these in mathematics because there's a real grounding for them while also realizing that God transcends them. And I've actually found this very useful 
for meditating, especially at like adoration or when I'm going up to receive communion, is you can start thinking about these different levels of infinity in mathematics. And no matter how high of a level of infinity you get to, God's transcending, you're still closer to the finite than you are to God at that point. And so you can then think about, this is where you're saying the infinite um, or the finite is not capable of the infinite. This is where I think the Eucharist from a Catholic perspective is so fascinating because here, under these finite accidents is an infinite essence, which transcends beyond even infinite numbers. That's very interesting. Very uh, interesting thing about it. I did not know that um, uh, Lutheran, there was a Lutheran a the, uh, mathematician who was influenced by Augustine. So would someone in the Thomist tradition deny that there are infinite ideas in God's mind? Like I, I just take that for granted, but would people deny no, that? No, I don't think they would deny that, but I think it's, not worked out in the same way. I would actually like to know better how Thomas worked this out. Um, and you know, there is quite a bit of influence of SCOTUS on the later Thomist manualist tradition as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's influence going back and forth. Cause we, you know, there was a lot of polemics back and forth between the Thomists and SCOTUS, but they were all reading each other's stuff and borrowing from one another. And so it's yeah, not they, like it's a separate. They seem, to agree. they seem to agree quite a bit. Yeah, I like there was just, yeah. I was going to mention, I think it's quite interesting. There's a recent discovery by Giorgio Pini of Scotus's own lecture notes on the, on um, Aristotle's metaphysics. And it's very clear. He keeps referring to someone in it called the expositor, which is very clearly Thomas Aquinas. So he was clearly using Thomas Aquinas's metaphysics commentary in his classroom. So it was not like these movements were so separate as we can sometimes think they were. Well, right. It's, it's the same way like the infralapsarian and superlapsarian Calvinists were largely building off of each other. They just had a different position on the logical ordering of the decrees of God. Uh, but I, another reason I'm drawn to Scotism is because my favorite argument for God that is comprehensible mm -hmm. to the average person is the Mandelbrot set. Because the Mandelbrot set is something we discovered. We didn't invent it. So it shows that there is some platonic world of the forms, at least, where there but it's not just uh, a simple infinite. It's a very complex infinite with infinite complexity. Yeah. Um, it's not just some repeating pattern. It's like the more you zoom into the Mandelbrot set, the more complexity you find. Um, and that just intuitively uh, suggests that there is like an infinite mind that um, created. No, that. I think so. Cause I think what's so interesting, you mentioned in complex analysis. You know, I don't think Scotus invented complex analysis. I love complex analysis, so I wish he did. I don't yeah. think he did. But I think is interesting about it is that he, he when you add in this word a negative one, right, we're really breaking all the definitions. When we raise E to an imaginary power, we're breaking the definitions of these things that we introduce. So you would expect that mathematics should start breaking and we should start getting it, contradictions it starts working, here. It's it getting working better. I know it's amazing. It's just, that shouldn't happen unless there's something real to it. Yeah. I used to have doubts about the existence of God. And once I learned about complex analysis, it all went away, mm -hmm. especially like Euler's identity. Euler was a devout Calvinist and mm -hmm. they convinced him of God when he realized that E to the power of pi times I my plus one is zero. All these numbers oh, wow. that are seemingly unreal. Did you know about Euler's identity? No, no, no. I know that one. I didn't know that was what convinced Euler of God. I knew Euler was a devout Christian. I love that part. No, I, I didn't yeah. say it convinced him of God. I said he okay. saw proof, proof that God exists. Oh, I don't proof know if that was, okay, yeah. I don't know if that was his like conversion story or anything. Um, okay. But yeah, so I uh, would these mathematical proofs of God work better under Scotism than Thomism, in your opinion? Um, I don't want to say work better. You know, there's actually, I've just been working through recently, um, Father Gregory Pine's dissertation on exemplary causality in St. Thomas to try and better understand this a bit. But it's hard to approach from one paradigm to the other because you start reading all their terms within your own paradigm. And then I'm not sure, like, where am I misreading this versus where am I reading it correctly and stuff? Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know better, though, some of this yeah. stuff and some of these details. That's where I'm, I think need, more research here needs to be done. Dang it. You're too nuanced for my simple minded binary questions. <laughs> um, so I, I mentioned, um, I mentioned that I like, uh, I like uh, mathematical proofs for God. I'm mm -hmm. interested in Scotus's argument for God. I haven't been able to understand it yet. So, so what is it in layman's terms? Yeah, yeah. Essentially it's like, it's essentially if you took a cosmological argument and then you turned it into an ontological argument halfway through. So what Scotus is concerned about with a, it's what he's concerned about with the cosmological arguments is we start with these contingent premises of things existing. 
And he's worried, all right, can we actually move back from contingent premises to a necessary conclusion? Because it seems that if the premises are contingent, the conclusion only follows upon the truth of the conclusions, or rather of the truth of the premises. So then our conclusion is almost contingent in some sense then. So it essentially, he wants to argue not from the actual existence of things, but from the potential existence of things. And so he wants to say, all right, if there are things that potentially exist, there has to be, then we can say that they necessarily potentially exist. Because if they potentially exist, it has to be necessary that they potentially exist. And if they necessarily potentially exist, then there has to be a necessary cause of their necessary potential existence. And so from here then, Scotus is able to say that God is, there has to essentially be a divine mind to necessarily potentially know the, to, to know these necessary potentialities. And there has to be a divine will to actually create these necessary, to create the actual things from the potentials or else they wouldn't have been potential in the first place. Interesting. So let me, let me try and, um, see just repeat that to see if i understand it so there's yeah. there are things that could exist right mm -hmm. um and if they could exist then it it must be that they could exist it could not be that they could not exist if you're saying they could exist yeah um and there needs to be some sort of database where everything that could exist is stored which is the divine mind right yeah I've already and used that. Know. I've already used the mathematical argument for God saying that there's an infinite number of numbers. Is there some infinite hard drive at the center of our universe that contains all the numbers? No, it's the divine mind. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he, he thinks basically there's four attributes you can really get to from this argument. Another one is infinity. And he has an argument for simplicity as well, which I can't recall right now. But it's also the divine will because these things are not merely just possibilities. But in order to be possibilities, it has to be possible that they actually exist. Well, then there has to be something that could actualize them. And that would be then the divine will. That's the divine will. Okay, so yeah. you mentioned simplicity. It's a good transition to this. Um, yeah. The doctrine of simplicity, it is the nuances in like the different versions of divine simplicity are so minute that I don't understand them. So like mm -hmm. what is the difference between Scotus's version of simplicity and maybe a, a Thomistic version. Yeah. So I think it's going to really turn in um, the Thomist language on whether you're going to say it's what might be called like a minor virtual distinction or a major virtual distinction. That What's called a major virtual distinction is essentially what Scotus is going to call like a formal distinction. So, so what, what does the virtual distinction mean? Yeah. So in the um, minor virtual distinction, something exists only by way of its ability to cause it versus in the um, major virtual distinction, it's going to exist as an actual formality in the thing, some necessary aspect of the thing. So you are necessarily a human. So you have humanity as some formality of you. It can't exist apart from you. It's not something we can touch. Um, because even for SCOTUS, separability is sort of a hint towards a real distinction, but it's not necessary for a real distinction because i mean the three persons of the trinity aren't separable and they're really distinct but there's three distinct realities we're talking about the three persons of the trinity are not three aspects of god they're three really distinct persons and so within god them right for the um thomist they're going to see fundamentally when we get back to all these different divine attributes we're really understanding different ways in which these are somehow contained in god uh, but not as even different aspects of him. Ultimately, God, there aren't even different aspects. And versus Scotus would say, all right, we can still say there are different aspects, so long as we don't say these are real These are real things at all. And I can understand the Thomas get a bit concerned that the Scotus are sort of compromising um, divine simplicity, but I think since we're not saying the divine essence is composed of different things, what we're saying is that when we consider it under different aspects, there's we can understand these different things about it versus for the Thomas, my concern is that even though they want to say that all the different divine names are not collapsible to one another that i don't see how that's not the case you know right i guess the analogy i would use to explain scotus simplicity correct me if this is wrong <laughs> is that you know um five and negative five are different numbers but if you multiply both of them to infinity 
if you uh, it converges to the same point because mathematically in, infinity is one point in, in the complex plane. So it's like uh, positive numbers, negative numbers, positive imaginary numbers and negative imaginary numbers are all distinct. But when you uh, multiply them to infinity, then they all converge to one thing. So would that be a good analogy for the different attributes of God? I'm not sure just because it seems we're treating infinity in this case as like a point in a projective geometry here then. So it seems that we're treating infinity in a very different way in which but I think we could say, right, if let's say the universe was infinitely large, you want to get to the edge and see God, you could say in that sense. I mean, we know the universe is finite from scripture, but if it were infinite theoretically, right, and you went on, on and on, you could in that sense say God could be infinitely far away, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I'd want to say that this is the way different aspects are contained in God. The way Scutus is going to make a distinction here, which is very important, again, going back to his metaphysics, between uh, what he'll call um, pure perfections and mixed perfections. So mixed perfections are in some way necessarily mixed with potency. So, for example, um, being able to run really fast, right? You could always, however fast you could run, you could always run a mile an hour faster, you know? So obviously mm -hmm. this, in some sense, there has to be some limitation on it in order for it to exist as a perfection at all. So that's what he would call like a mixed perfection. So that can't exist properly in God. It exists, I mean, this would essentially exist in the sense of a minor virtual distinction, not in the sense of a formal distinction in God, because God is able to cause things that can move really fast. And so we know that must somehow be present in God, but it's not present properly. Versus Scotus will say there are things of pure perfections, which don't have any, um, or can exist without limitations. So things like intellect or will can exist in both a finite mode and in an infinite mode. And so what fundamentally differentiates our knowledge, our intellect, and God's intellect is not, there's a univocal definition of intellect in both cases, but what differentiates them is the disjunctive transcendentals, that finite and infinite and simple and complex, contingent and necessary, uh, eternal and temporal, all these different distinctions are going to say that the way in which uh, God knows or God wills or God is wise is completely different from our way of being but there is a common univocal definition of the two. And so in this case, then there would be some common formality of the two. And that's how we would say they're for these things are formally distinct in God. Interesting. Uh, so is there anything distinct about Scotus's Trinitarian theology as far as Western Trinitarian theology goes? Um, I think so. I think I am wondering, some people have emphasized the differences, but there is definitely, I think, a difference going on in terms of is the emphasis placed upon the mode of production or on the relations after? So if we speak of it temporally, to, so to speak, right? We can think of all right, the Son coming forth from the Father and the Spirit coming forth from the Father and the Son, or we can think of it primarily in terms of the relations that then distinguish the two. And I think the question then is going to be which emphasis those two aspects are placed upon. Yeah. You know? And so Thomas is going to place more of the emphasis upon those relations of opposition. And Scotus will still say the relations of opposition are still what distinguish them. But we can, in some sense, place more of the emphasis upon the modes of production. So Scotus will say then that if he affirms the filioque is true on the basis that the fathers in scripture teach it, because if it weren't true, the son, the spirit would still be distinct from the son because the son comes forth, forth by mode of intellect and the spirit by mode of will. And that's sufficient to distinguish the two. Versus yeah, for Thomas, sure. he would think that's not sufficient to distinguish the two. And I, I think I would side more with Thomas on this because of Calvin's doctrine of autotheos, um, which is not that different from, like Robert Bellarmine said that Calvin's doctrine of autotheos is still orthodox. But mm -hmm. we are, Calvin, the Calvinist tradition has been very careful about the language we use in terms of the production of the Son and the Spirit by the Father. Uh, Calvin mm -hmm. really makes it sound like um, these are just analogous terms for the ineffable relations between the Trinitarian persons. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he does say that hypostatically, the Son and the Spirit are from the Father, the Spirit's from the Father and the Son, but he really mm -hmm. doesn't want to make it sound like the Father divinizes the, the Son in any oh, way. Yeah, yeah and, and this I think is important, that there's no real distinction between the persons and the divine essence. So this is where... Um, what is it? We can distinguish. This is where the language 
that Bonaventure will pick up on is the triple infinity. That in some sense, God is a singular infinity of the singular divine essence and the sense of a triple infinity that each of the persons is infinite. Right. Um, I, I would agree with that. Like even back when I was like a, a theological kindergartner, my explanation for the Trinity, whenever a Muslim would say, oh, you believe one plus one plus one is one, I'd be like, infinity plus infinity plus infinity is infinity. Like, that was my explanation even back yeah. then. Yeah, and and that's pretty much, I think, the reasoning Scotus would use, uh, if you want to, like, refute it. So, obviously, that infinite, I mean, in a sense, God transcends even that infinite quantity, but I think those sort of transfinite numbers can begin to teach us something about the nature of infinity, even as long as we realize that God goes even beyond that. Right. So something that Thomas said that I agreed with for a long time, like when I first became Christian, I tried to, I was wondering why is God three persons, not two persons, not four persons. I tried to logically look for logical answers. And I found Thomas Aquinas saying there are no logical explanations for why God needs to be three. We just accept that because mm. revelation teaches that to us. But then I heard that Scotus actually believes we can logically argue why God needs to be uh, three persons. So how is that? Yeah, so no, both of them will agree this is a matter of divine revelation. So you can't prove it one way or the other. But you also can't prove, this is an important point, that God is only one person. Because right? the Muslim would say, oh, you guys can't prove God is three persons. And you could go back and say, well, prove he's one person, right? But mm -hmm. I think we can then look for, is there some reason for it? Even if we can't, let's say, prove it in the sense of an Aristotelian demonstration, where the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. We can then still look at and say, all right, there is still seems to be some reason that's the case, even if you can't necessarily prove it. Yeah. So what would be the reason that it's the case? So it would be the case that the son comes uh, forth from the father by means of intellect and the spirit by means of will. Yeah. I, I could see someone thinking of like a, a, a third category and uh, besides intellect and will because... Mm -hmm. Uh, that we just haven't thought of yet. So uh, I'm I'm skeptical of making of any sort of personal properties in the three persons of the so, Trinity. So to, to be fair, it's not personal properties. They're still essential properties. So this is why yeah. since intellect is still then in a sense prior to the will in a very specific sense, then once the sun is produced, speaking again here temporally, even though God isn't temporal, we have to transcend that idea. But um, mm -hmm. then the sun whether the spirit would come forth from both the father and the son. Because these are right. ultimately essential properties that we're thinking of. These are of the divine essence. And for Scotus, also a big reason that um, we have intellect and will as our two fundamental categories is it goes down to the two kinds of powers that can exist, which are natural powers and voluntary powers. Something can either necessarily follow from it or can voluntarily follow from it. Right. So... I was going to, I was going to ask the Eastern Orthodox seem to believe that um, self-existence is not a, an attribute of the divine essence. It is only a personal property of the father. Uh, would SCOTUS affirm that as well? Uh, you know, absolutely not. Besides yeah, those distinctions sure. we just made of relation, because that's the thing. It's like, it ultimately is relation that distinguishes the three persons because they share everything, the essence in common. So everything about the essence in common. Right. So, yeah, when a lot of people misunderstand Calvin's autotheos, what he's really trying to say is that aseity is a divine mm. attribute. Yeah. And I'm not sure if all the Eastern Orthodox deny that or just the ones I've talked to. Do they deny it generally? Mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah. Is divine? It seems to be a disputation about the correct reading of the Cappadocian Fathers. And, you know, I took, I did um, Greek and Latin in college, and I took a course on um, St. Gregory Nazianzen. Nothing to do with this at all. It was just a sermon of his. And we spent an entire semester on one sermon and didn't get through all the Greek. So, um, yeah. I just think the Cappadocians are very, very complex. And so I don't really take what random people say about them seriously anymore. Yeah, that, that does make sense. So, I guess uh, one of my last, my, my second to last question is. I've heard this idea of the univocity of being. Let me mm -hmm. try to see if I understand it. So mm -hmm. it, uh, according to like the Thomas, to people who don't believe in it, God's being can be compared to our being, but it's mm -hmm. not the same kind of being as our being. Whereas in the Scotus sense, God's being is the same kind of being as our being, but to the infinite, whereas our being, being is finite. So it's it's a quantitative rather than a qualitative difference, right? 
So, no. So you, you got the Thomist part correct there, of the right comparison. But that's sort of almost then, because they were formulated in very different contexts. So Thomas is generally following a general tradition of analogical uh, concept of being. Mm -hmm. But what Scotus is dealing with is an issue brought up by Henry of Ghent, where Henry of Ghent pointed out that when we come to logic, you can either something can either be univocal or equivocal. You can't put an analogical term in the middle of a syllogism and have the syllogism follow. And since analogy then is equivocity, ultimately then God is equivocally being. And so then Henry of Ghent thinks that God has to essentially place within our minds a common concept for us, a, a concept of divine being and a concept of created being. And then we can understand each of those by those different things that were created. Versus then Scotus pushes back and he says, no, the way we understand it is there's a logical university. This is, it's really a point he's making about analogy. He's not denying analogy, but what he's saying is contrary to the Thomas, you can't bring analogy into the, um, you can't bring analogy into logic because the Thomas will actually say that in certain cases you can have an analogical concept in an analogical term in the middle of the syllogisms. They need that in order to pr um, protect their position. But Scotus will say that there's a univocal common concept within analogy. So within an analogy, there's the two things are different. So they're equivocal, but there's some similarity and that's what's univocal. So when Scotus isn't saying that out there, there's some being that we can touch, right? That's gonna be a similar sort for God and a similar sort for creation. No, there's this common concept which is, it's really a negative definition. It's that to which uh, essay is not repugnant. So that to which existence is not repugnant. And so both God and creation can exist. And so that's what they share in common, their existence. But the modes in which they exist is radically different of uh, infinite and finite, simple and complex and so on. And so that's the way then in which they're gonna be distinguished. So he says metaphysically, you can have analogy. But that metaphysical analogy is rooted in the fact that there is a univocal part and equivocal part. Got it. So is so nothing is infinite besides God, right? Yeah, nothing could at least if there was something else that you could have that would be, say, like an infinite quantity, it would still be an infinite quantity. So in terms of metaphysically, it would actually still be finite because when we say infinite, we're not talking about a quantity so much as we're talking about a mode of being. OK, and my final question is. Um, I know that like people like Augustine in the early church followed more after Plato and then people like Aquinas followed more after Aristotle. So would Scotus lean any more in the direction of Plato than Thomas Aquinas did? Yeah, a lot of people ask this and I think this has sort of become like a um, like a meme that floats around in theology and in philosophy in general because you have the writings of Plato, then you have Aristotle, right? And then you have a long tradition of people drawing on both Plato and Aristotle. So the Aristotelianism that arrives in the West is not a pure Aristotelianism. It's an Aristotelianism that's been heavily filtered through Platonism. And likewise, the Platonism that Augustine receives is Neoplatonism, which is heavily influenced by Aristotelianism. So this is why, I mean, when they got Aristotle, they hadn't had the writings of Aristotle, but the concepts in Aristotle weren't entirely unfamiliar because through Neoplatonism, they were all over the church fathers, even if a lot of the church fathers they hadn't read Aristotle. What sort of comes back is a reading of Aristotle. There's a certain reception of Aristotle that Averroes has, which is very anti-Platonic. And it's one of the commentary traditions of Aristotle that enters the West. You also have Avicenna's reading, which is more Platonic. And when Thomas, for example, he writes commentaries on the um, divine names of Dionysius and on the um, Libra de Causis, which he's actually the one who proves that it's by Proclus and not by um, Aristotle. And he, he's very positive towards these works. He says that his introduction to both of them, that even though he thought Aristotle was overall a better philosopher, he actually says that he thinks pl the Platonists were better understood the divine than Aristotle did. And so both of these traditions enter there. And Scotus, I think, is within this larger tradition. So I think we can say within ancient philosophy, right, there is maybe a more anti-realist tradition, right, which might be including like atomism, Epicureanism, these sorts of things, and a more yeah. metaphysically realist tradition, which would include Aristotle, Plato, certain aspects of the Stoics and stuff. And so both of them are within this realist tradition. Um, Scotus sometimes gets lumped in with 
anti-realist because Occam sort of more leaning in that direction, but Occam formulates his anti-realism as a response to Scotus's very strong realism. Yeah, he's still I've, more... yeah I've, I've heard people call, call Scotus to nominalist and even mm. I know that's not true. Mm. Um, Cause yeah, w Scotus wants to defend very strongly that common natures are a real thing. So he's actually even more clear about realism in many ways than St. Thomas. Now, he's not a Platonist about it in the textbook sense of Plato, because very few Platonists actually believe the textbook version of Plato. It's unclear yeah. if Plato even did. But in the textbook version, there's these forms in heaven and things only have their essences insofar as they participate in those. And everyone in the Middle Ages rejects that. Um, there's a very strong sense of moderate realism in Scotus. But when he's discussing... This, he specifically says that these common natures are not fictions. And that's a language that's original to Scotus. Because when Occam formulates his position, he says these are fictions. These are only right. in the mind. Right. Now, I, I think just for a bunch of reasons, I reject nominalism. It's kind of cringe. Mm. But the like when I hear about like the atomists, I'm like, well, they were right about atoms. So, so I'm wondering, is can you believe in modern science especially evolution i know you're not an evolutionist i am mm. do you believe in modern science i'm not counting like the gender crap but like mm. mainstream modern science of, of, of a little while ago and hold to scotism basically i would say that because all i think in many ways scotus actually was important for the development of modern science in the sense mm -hmm. that because scotus held this very strong view of god's divine freedom well, if the world is contingent and free, we can't just know about the world by sitting in a room and thinking about it. We have to actually go out and investigate the world. Uh, Pierre Duhem did very good research in this, that um, we can actually go out and know the world from studying. And so this actually, I think, in some sense, breaks apart or frees science, for at least a certain degree, from metaphysics. It actually allows this contingent study of nature apart from necessary principles of metaphysics. Um, but I do think because still that hylomorphic um, philosophy of nature is very important to Scotus, that atomism would be a big problem. Now, I actually do know there is a large tradition of Scotus atomism, uh, but I, I don't see how that could work out. I'd like to study that more. Um, but I would also say that I actually think atomism has been refuted by modern science. And what I mean by that is, is what did the early atomists think? You can go read, for example, Robert Boyle. And he's very critical of hylomorphism. And he specifically is aware of what the schoolmen are saying, what the scholastics are saying. And he specifically is arguing against that in favor of atomism. And essentially what he thinks is that the world is made up of these little tiny balls or boxes or wherever they're shaped, right? And they combine and make different things. Well, that's not what atoms are in modern science. Fundamentally, right. what's the best model we have of atoms are waves of potential within quantum fields. Well, this is essentially goes back to Aristotle's view now that the closer you get to matter, the closer you are to getting to potency. The real things we encounter are the objects in front of us. Those have more actuality to them. And you can learn a lot from a thing from studying its material causes, but you're getting into an area of more potential. And so I actually think the way in which um, quantum physics treats atoms, atoms are almost a misnomer at this point. I think you're actually getting a lot closer to an Aristotelian approach. And I think SCOTUS... I, so that, there are a lot of people who have noticed this, and then they try to sort of fit quantum physics in the back door of Aristotle's natural philosophy. And I think that's actually the wrong approach as well, the further I've gone on in this. Um, I think we need to receive modern science in the way the scholastics received Aristotle, where they were critical at times of Aristotle. So no, this point was contrary to scripture. This point is in favor of it. But even when they received him and said, all right, this is compatible, they thought, let's actually interpret what he's saying and what this actually means. And I think that there's been this big problem of divorcing now the science and natural philosophy from one another. And we need to re-engage with science in both a critical yet intelligent way, where we're actually trying to understand the science itself. Because that's the other issue, is a lot of people interacting nowadays with modern science don't actually try and spend the time interacting with modern science, really. Like, they don't actually try and learn that. So I've been trying to spend a while uh, learning physics in my free time to really understand what are these scientists really saying. Nice. Very, very interesting. Thanks for your time. One last question. It's not really a question, it's just a, a speculation I've had. It's that scotism really emphasizes the freedom of god right mm -hmm. and i noticed that i think i can see the influence of that on the reform tradition particularly mm -hmm. the presbyterian tradition 
with John mm-hmm. Knox, and like as the Scottish Reformed as opposed to the Continental Reformed. Uh, do you think there might have been any influence on the fact that Scotus was Scottish and the Presbyterians are Scottish? Do you think the Presbyterian emphasis on the freedom of God and the absolute sovereignty of God, do you think there might have been any direct influence from Scotus because of, ge- of geography? It's possible. I, the, sort of the two big traditions of Scotism that I'm sort of aware of, like the famous schools of Scotism, was there was sort of an Irish school and an Italian school, and they were big rivals to one another. But I do know that Scotus was, people were aware of him in Scotland. There's actually sort of this whole fake hagiography of Scotus that starts floating around, I think actually around the time of the Reformation or something, in Scotland, because they want to have this big national hero. Um, versus the Irish Scotus, they actually try and write a whole their own hagiography of how Scotus was actually Irish instead. Um, in other words, does, it, it sometimes would be referred to as Scotland. And so um, it's possible there is, but again, I don't, it's, the thing is Scotus was very ubiquitous. So even if people weren't reading Scotus, his ideas were all in the air at the time, you know? Right. I, I, I've i never heard Scotus being cited by a, Presby- a Scottish Presbyterian, mostly because it's really hard to find Scottish Presbyterian works. But even if he wasn't, I think that maybe the ideas might have just been floating around because of how much Scottish Presbyterians emphasize the freedom of God in their theology. Yeah. We should also mention that just as much as there was the Scotus tradition of divine freedom, there's also a very distinct Occamist tradition of divine freedom. And these often get conflated with one another, but I think there's a very important difference. And this comes down to how they treat this distinction that's in both of them of the potentia absoluta, or God's absolute power, and the potentia ordinata, or God's ordained power. So for Occam, these two are really divorced from one another. So God does, in fact, Occam thinks, act in an ordered way. And we know that because God has revealed himself that way. But God could have just as easily, in Occam's view, created a, an absurd world. God didn't have to create a reasonable world. Versus for Scotus, he thinks God would be like a madman if he acted this way. So even though, though the two are formally distinct for Scotus, we can think of the fact that God could have created an infinite number of possible worlds. God only ever acts in an ordered way. I, I see a lot of misreadings of Scotus originate in certain places of this, where people will say Scotus says a certain thing is possible by the potentia absoluta, and then conclude that Scotus thinks that that's actually possible. All that Scotus means is that that's not contrary to God's power, but it doesn't mean that God would ever actually will that way. And I think that that's a very central issue for Scotus. Versus for Occam, ultimately what God wills is going to be what is ordered. Versus for Scotus, God wills according to what is ordered. Right. I saw someone just in the comments um, say that Rutherford was definitely Scotus. Rutherford's one of my favorites and that the Covenanter tradition was very Scotist. Please contact me somehow, either by emailing me at gospelforthelease at gmail.com or DMing me on Twitter or Instagram or commenting on a YouTube video. Yes, Gabriel, please just contact me somehow because I would like to ask you about that and where I can do more research on that because I'm still learning. And thank you for helping me in my research because I really want to learn more about Scotism and the Scotus tradition. So thank you for your time. If you're looking at contemporary reform Scotus, um, Anthony Vos actually has a lot of very good stuff on Scotus. Now, it's clearly a reform uh, reception. His book on the theology of Scotus is very good. Um, sort of the one area where I disagree with it is you just have to flip through the table of contents and you'll see what's missing is Scotus as Mariology. Because this for Scotus right. is very right. central to everything. We go back to his ordering of the divine decrees. What's first in the order of intention is not only Christ, but also Mary. And so for Scotus, all things are for the sake of the incarnation and the divine maternity. And so these two have to come together at the beginning, Scotus thinks, um, of all things. And so that's going to be where everything differs then, because there's also then this strong sense of free, even though there's a sense of predestination, there's also a strong sense of free human cooperation, of Mary's completely voluntary fiat to um, God's plan, while it's also predestined at the same time. Interesting. Yeah, well, the the early reformers, especially Heinrich Bollinger, had a very high Mariology. Um, Mm -hmm. Like... Uh, Heinrich Bollinger believed in the uh, bodily assumption of Mary, even. So, I mean, sub, sub part of me, I used to want to be a nominalist. I didn't know what the word nominalism means. This was before I knew that this was a philosophical school of thought. I used to believe God could have made two plus two equal five, which I think mm-hmm. often would have said. Um, 
And yeah. part of me still instinctively wants to say that because I don't mm-hmm. want to say that there is a mathematical system that God is subject to that is above him. But I also know the implications of nominalism is basically every all the chaos we see yeah. today. So that's something I still struggle with. I actually think that there's a mathematics can actually really help us think of this potentia absoluta potentia ordinato distinction, right? So the math of our universe could be very different, but that's because the axioms could have been different. I don't think God could make a universe where there's not a consistent set of axioms. And so that's what I would say is the ordering of things, right? So if someone was asking, for example, could God make a square circle? Well, actually, God could make a square circle if the geometry of our uni- universe was the taxicab metric, where you can't move diagonally at all. If you can't move diagonally, then you can actually draw a square or something with four right angles and equal sides, where also every point is equidistant from a center. But that's because the geometry would actually be different. So there is a well ordering to it. So this is where we then have to go out and observe the actual universe we're in, right? Same with, I think, how modern science works. We should expect that things are internally consistent. So we shouldn't expect that our physics equations are going to contradict one another. But we should we should also not expect that you could just sit around and think about how physics might be able to work in any possible universe and then conclude it has to work that way here. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has answered a lot of my questions. And yes, I guess I can safely call myself a reformed SCOTUS now. So thank you. Yeah. And hopefully soon we'll be getting you to be a Catholic SCOTUS. We'll see. (laughs) All right. right, Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you. See you later. And thank you everyone for watching.